Substantial portfolio. I mean, okay, so well, for one thing, for one thing, I was like, I thought this actually went to the last year. So, for the rest of my life, you're going to have a very nice picture. I think you can't see that. So welcome to today's Council on Foreign Relations meeting on Women in the Armed Forces, the Future of the Military. Uh, we're starting things promptly, uh, 8.30 and a half. Um, today we have with us Juliet Byer, who is the Principal Director of Force Resiliency of the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness at the Pentagon. Gail Tema Clemen, she's the Senior Fellow for Women in Foreign Policy at CFR and author of Ashley's War, The Untold, Untold Story of a Team of Women Soldiers on the Special Ops Battlefield, just now out in paperback. And uh, she said that uh, three of the women from the book um, are in the room, so we will be putting you on the spot later. Uh, and we also have Agnes Garvin Schaefer, who's a senior political scientist at the RAND Corporation and has done many studies on the issue at hand. So we start with the first question. Last December, Secretary of Defense Ash Carter opened all combat roles to women. Can you give us an update? Where does it stand? Sure, absolutely. Thank Bringing you. Bringing policy into action. Yes, absolutely. So good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. So as Kimberly said, so the Secretary announced in, in early December that he was opening all remaining positions um, to women. And uh, during that announcement, he directed that the service kind of develop uh, detailed implementation plans to come back to him by the 1st of January, explaining exactly, articulating exactly the details on how they were going to make this happen. Uh, we stood up an implementation group that was co-chaired by the Deputy Secretary of Defense and the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And they combed through, we had several meetings with the Vice Chiefs and the leadership of the department looking through each of the services. They cross-briefed each other on the details of the plan looking to make sure that they, there were no um, issues and that everything was covered and that they had all addressed all of the Secretary's concerns that were laid out in his December memo. Uh, then in 9 March, the Secretary, we uh, briefed those up to him. He reviewed all of the plans personally himself and he approved all of the plans in 9 March and he said everyone go forth and open everything no later than April 1st, which we are past that date. Positions are open and people are starting to assess and recruit and assign women. And um, so that's where we stand today. Got it. So I guess the, the shorter version of that question is, when are we going to see a woman Navy SEAL? <laughs> so, well, well okay. so the short answer to that is probably in, at the absolute earliest, um, the summer of 2018. So the, the SEAL pipeline is, is very long. So the next enlisted SEAL course uh, doesn't start until this summer in the officer SEAL course later in the year. So of course, the assessment and selection process is very long to even get into the pipeline. And then given the, the length of the training, it takes about two years. So if we have a woman in one of the first two classes, you still won't even see the first one until 18. And, and same for Rangers? So the Ranger, as this group knows, the Ranger course is, is significantly shorter. So um, there are, so the Army did um, recruit their first female um, enlisted infantry um, woman. She signed up, she'll go to, she'll go to the course later this summer. Uh, it, it depends. So, for instance, the academies, when they graduate, there are a number of women, both at West Point and at the Naval Academy, who have identified that they're interested in possibly going into these career tracks. So, of course, they'll get commissioned here shortly, and then they will go to their courses. So each course is different based on the service and the occupation. I, I, I taught at the Army War College last year, so if I didn't <laughs> ask about the Army, I'd be in trouble. Um, so, but we were talking about um, beforehand that there's a certain fiction that women haven't already been in combat because in the past decade plus at war, they have. And 
Gail, you said you just covered some remarks that um, where they where the commander brought that out. Yes. Yeah, so first of all, good morning. I, I'm really delighted to be here and to have all of you here in an early morning. So thank you. Uh, thanks to this incredible panel and uh, really for me from a storytelling perspective, it's been a huge privilege and really a journey to bring a story about which I was entirely ignorant uh, to life, which was that, you know, well, back in 2011, there were women out on nighttime operations alongside Army Rangers, Navy SEALs, and other special operations teams, you know, seeing the kind of combat experienced by less than 5% of the entire United States military, all while the combat ban was very much in place. Uh, and for me, the story was never uh, simply a war story. It's really a friendship story because so many times we forget that what we haven't seen is the connection among women in the same way we've seen the connection among men and that Kim has covered you know, beautifully for years, which is this bond of war, which we uh, often associate only with men, actually has been experienced by women. And in the end of the day, it's really about service and sacrifice and patriotism and serving a cause greater than yourself. And gender is secondary to it. Um, and it's really now that our stories are catching up, that we're starting to see the reality of that. And, and uh, I was at an event for Ashley's War paperback launch uh, last Wednesday at the National Infantry Museum in Columbus, Georgia, which some of you might know, uh, right next to Fort Benning. And Colonel Fivecoat, who opened Army Ranger School to women, talked about the charade to which we had all been accustomed of the ground combat rule. And, and I thought it was just very powerful because the truth is the commanders in the field were working around these rules and at war trying to figure out how to get the best people in the jobs they needed and working around systems. You know, one, one of the uh, soldiers who's here, one of the young women from Ashley's War, was in a job that was coded for men for years before the combat ban was lifted. Like officially, a female could not be in that role when you tried to put it in the system. But her commander wanted the best person for the job. And so I think really, for me, the best storytelling simply takes us into a world we didn't know that already existed in Ashley's War for me. It was just a way to tell a story about the fact that um, there was an exceptional group of soldiers who answered when their country asked well before they officially were there. Allowed, allowed to do it. Correct. And of, of course, if you were um, an MP and Absolutely. escorting um, a convoy from one point A to point B in Iraq or Afghanistan, you were frequently under fire Absolutely. and having to fire back. So. And, and, and also, um, the MPs have long been integrated, which is something I think doesn't come, military police, for, for, for folks who aren't super familiar with this conversation, right, have long been men and women, and women have been leading uh, in, in that arena. And so I think that sometimes we talk about these issues as if, you know, we just discovered them uh, yesterday night at 11 p.m., uh, when the truth is that uh, many of these conversations have been going on for years, and, and women have been very much a part of America's post-9-11 wars. Now, Agnes, you did some of the, the studies on this, uh, including studies of certain organizations like the Marine Corps that didn't want this integration to happen. Uh, we're on record saying we want to exclude certain jobs um, to women. So what were some of the drawbacks that people brought up? Well, so Rand did a, a large suite of work um, on this. Um, and we did work for, for many of the services, um, as well as some work for Juliet um, on the standards piece. Um, and, and we didn't. Uh, you know, look so much at, at drawbacks per se, but we, we were really focused on implementation um, in much of our work. Um, and as a result of that, we, we sort of focused on lessons learned. So this is not new. Um, and we have had these previous waves of integration of not just women, but other outgroups, such as gays and lesbians. Um, and there are some similarities um, between those outgroups um, and those previous waves. So we tried to draw out some of those lessons learned, especially from um, previous um, occupations that were opened, um, such as engineers, aviation. Um, and what we found is that we really didn't do a very good job at, at documenting that process and identifying those lessons learned. So we really emphasized um, to the services that as they do this, they really need to focus on monitoring this implementation along the way so that they can identify issues quickly 
um, and adjust course, um, and that they can learn from the process. Um, so the process needs to be flexible enough for them to be able to adjust along the way. Um, we also looked at um, lessons from foreign militaries. Um, and one of the major things, um, especially with the Marine Corps uh, work, we really tried to emphasize, initially they came back to us and, and said, well, we, okay, we have this goal. If, we ha if we're going to do this, we have this goal of very large numbers. Um, and we emphasized to them that nowhere in the world are we seeing large numbers. Um, we're, we're talking. So nowhere in the world that has done integration. That has done this, right. Are you seeing large numbers yes. of women in so combat roles? Single, low single percentages. Um, those are the those are the types of numbers we're talking about, and in the special oper operations community, that's even smaller. Um, and and so we emphasize to them that um, you know if you're trying to define success in this integration process, and you're defining that based on numbers you're setting yourself up to fail because the likelihood is so small that you're going to have be able to uh, you know recruit these large numbers so um, and and that's you know we dug into that a little bit more and that's there were two main reasons um, that the numbers were so low in foreign militaries that this may not be the case here um, it may be different um, but in foreign militaries it was because women weren't really interested in these positions um, and secondly, they couldn't make the standards. So there, there were two, twofold there. So that brings us back to you and the question of, uh, as the policymaker, mm -hmm. do you have a quota of women that you want to try to absorb into the combat roles? Okay. And, and, the and, 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 how, and how do you keep people right. from the, the mantra I keep hearing over and over, I'm conscious of the fact that there are four women up here discussing this, so, so I've got to play devil's advocate. I keep hearing from male officers, you just know that there's going to be pressure on the bureaucracy to lower the standards, to make the numbers. Right. And so we hear that also. Um, so the short answer to the question is no. There are no quotas and there are no goals. Um, I, I want to come back to it. I do want to make a point, though, about the Marine Corps. I think what gets lost in this a lot is that, there, that there's this narrative that the Marine Corps was opposed to integration. And I don't think that's true. I, as somebody, again, who's um, as a retired Marine myself and who has lived this and who have watched the Marine Corps, they, they, the Marine Corps did a significant good faith amount of work here. And I think it's important to, to kind of recognize that they asked for exception, but a very discreet exception. So the Marine Corps actually recommended opening armor, opening artillery. The Marine Corps recommended opening the vast majority of their positions. And they requested from the Secretary of kind of a very discreet exception on infantry and, and long range reconnaissance. So I think, again, that's really important. And the concerns that the Marine Corps raised, again, all of the services, the Air Force, the Navy, uh, SOCOM had very similar. So the Marine Corps was not that far off from everyone else. They were just the only ones that chose to request an exception. So I think that's an important point that gets lost. Um, but with regard to the standards, um, yes, we hear that all of the time. And so that's why when you look at Secretary Carter's memo and he has his guiding principles, he, he specifically talks about, one, right, the need to make sure that we have the right standards, that they're occupationally specific, that they're current and they're operationally relevant because, again, that's the core, the standard of everything that we do. And then once we, that was why it was so important to review and validate the standards because now we have an ability to kind of definitively stand behind a standard that's unemotional that we can explain and articulate and it is what's required to do the job. Recognition also, right, that the number of women that are going to want to do these jobs is small and then the number of women that can meet the standard beyond that is even smaller. So there's a full recognition that the numbers may be very, very small or none at all. And that's what the Secretary said. So equal opportunity doesn't mean equal participation. We recognize there may be very, again, very small or maybe none. So how do you guard against that, right? Mm -hmm. By having a solid standard that yeah. everyone are, can. Are you publishing that standard so that everyone knows what it is oh. and can tell if it changes? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So all, all of the services, well, let me back up. So all of the services have, this is, again, I don't want to, the services have had standards. But we've never drilled down um, in, in the manner that we had um, this time over the past three and a half years. So each of the services, again, went through every single occupational standard. And they clearly defined what the standard was for entry into the occupation. 
at like, and then also like what the standards are for not only an entry level soldier, but also then a sergeant. And then the standards for a sergeant first class or a gunnery sergeant are different than the standards for a PFC. So they have laid out very clearly in, in, their, in their manuals what the, uh, the standards for a session, we call them a session, and then the standards for retention. So those, those are out there. Um, I would also say that they've institutionalized the process that we went through over the three and a half years, so because they learned a tremendous amount on how to do this right. Um, for instance, right, the direct ground combat rule said you could close an occupation to women if the vast majority of women couldn't do it. So what did that mean, right? That was very subjective. And so now it's a, it's a definable standard. Okay. Does that make sense? It does. Okay. It does. Um, and, and of course the critics out there are going to say, all right, well, let's, let's see it in operation. Yeah, and just one to that point, it was really fascinating. I covered the opening of Ranger School to Women, and I was in pre-Ranger in March, I guess, and then uh, in Florida in Swamp Phase in August. And, you know, I went to write one piece, which was just sort of a straight, you know, army, and that I ended up writing a piece that had the word standards in it probably 79 times because it was the only word anybody wanted to talk to me about, whether a woman or man. Uh, the... Um, our, the advisors, the women who were serving as ranger school advisors, would come up to me and say, we never want the standard lowered. Make sure your piece reflects that. And all of the men I would talk to, some of whom I had known from the process of reporting Ashley's War, would say, I don't care, but no standard can be lowered. And there were lots of questions around that. I mean, I think that's why they brought reporters in a couple different times trying to show, look, there is not going to be a different standard. And at the end of the day, anytime humans are involved, there is a level mm -hmm. of subjectivity. But I think they worked very hard from Fort Benning leadership to show that this is a transparent process and the standard is the thing that's most important. And, and the one bit of humor is that at 4.45 AM, which I know you know those mornings when I met uh, some of the Ranger School leadership at the um, Benning Gate, uh, this one very storied uh, retired ranger said to me, you know, what's amazing is I never heard people show this much love for the standard when I was active duty. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so I think it was interesting to hear his perspective that, you know, the standard has always been something that's shifting, but I think now when everything else is shifting around it, it's even more important for that standard to be something that uh, everyone uh, understands and that is not changed for anyone. Yes. Well, I do want to, right, to your point about sta standards will shift, right? So equipment will change, requirements will change, and so there, standards will change. But it so has standards to be will change because the equipment changes, right. and therefore the ability needed to operate that equipment will change. Exactly. But we have clearly defined what it takes to be successful on the battlefield, and the standard is derived from that, and it's derived for what's required today. So we do recognize there's going to be pressure. There will be people that will ask questions but, about why not enough. But you'll you'll always have to be able to drag a comrade who weighs 200 plus, plus their 80 pound pack and their gun wounded out of the line of fire. Isn't that one of those Absolutely. standards that just never Absolutely. stops? We often use the, the example of, of tankers, right? The round weighs what it weighs and you have to take it out of the rack. You must have the upper body strength to turn in the seat and load the round into the breech. It's a, it's a defined weight, it's a defined height, and it's a defined distance, and it doesn't matter. Um, I often use the term man, woman, giraffe, bunny rabbit. That is what it takes to do that, and so. So that. what about the fact that some studies have revealed that women do have a higher incidence of injuries after some of these heavy weight-bearing um, occupations? So you might have a high dropout rate from these combat positions where they, they might wash out after a year or two. It, will the military find a way to absorb them back into another role? Um, yeah, I think that they're working through that. Um, but what we found from foreign militaries is that there are ways to mitigate like against what? those uh, injury rates. Equipment is one, one of those. Um, and I think they're, just as they were drilling down to the standards, which I think really um, this issue of really nailing down those standards is one of the real benefits that came out of this whole process, both for men and women, um, because they really thought through rationally what does somebody, regardless of their gender, need to do for that occupation. But they're now drilling down into what kind of equipment changes they can make, again, both for men and, and women. Um, so for instance, um, carrying your pack. Mm -hmm. You know, you can adjust the waist belt for people who have shorter torsos, men or women, um, you know, those kinds of issues. I know they're, they're working through, um, you know, the uh, armored plates and things like that. 
again for people with shorter torsos. Um, so I think they're so working. So rather than those. making it gender specific, they're exactly. just thinking about integrating smaller people. Right. In, but but there are women specific injuries that I've heard about, like the, the hip displacement yes. from long marches because the hips are shaped differently in men than women. Right. So um, again, four militaries have have gone through this process. Some of them have integrated but 20, like, 25 Like which years ones, ago. since you said you looked at four? So Canada has been integrated uh, for a long time. Uh, we looked at 55 countries initially okay. and then narrowed down um, to, mo to our allies. Um, but um, so, you know, you can tr uh, train women uh, over longer distances uh, and longer times. So you can sort of graduate their training so that they're not uh, they're training over a longer period of time and they're conditioning their bodies over a longer period of time and that allows them to strengthen. So, so the, the bones have time. I've, I've heard something about this that you, you slowly increase the weight that the bones are bearing so they exactly. get thicker instead of um, <coughs> stressing them early and causing them to fracture. Exactly. And they, and they build their core um, and their upper body. Um, so. But that is slightly changing training and standards. It is. It is so there. There is a trade-off there. Um, you know, uh, they foreign militaries have kind of had them train before they enlist um, or before they start some of these combat occupations. Um, so you could do that training ahead of time. Okay, um, but so that brings us back to the question that I heard brought up. For instance, with seals and buds, you know, you've got to now add in. Uh, a women's room, women's quarters, et cetera. The, there's an added cost associated with um, equality. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an added cost associated with this extra training that you're talking about and these equipment changes. Is that worth it to the taxpayer? Well, so first, I, I think that, that, that there's, there is a lot of discussion that there's added cost, but when we actually had, when all of the services actually looked at that, what they found was there really wasn't. Most service members live in rooms right now, but they're, they're barracks, they're not open squad base. So actually there was very little on the facility side of the house that had to be done. So they're and not in a room full of a, a bunch of bunks like we've seen in the old movies. Exactly. So the only four instances, so at BUDS, at the SEAL training school out in California, they just had to build one new restroom. So that was that was the extent of the the facilities modifications that needed to be done, and they wanted they needed to do some stuff to the barracks, but the costs there were very um, minor. And the same thing, the, both the Marine Corps, the Army, and the Air Force all came back and said they didn't need to do any facilities modernization; that they were they were good where they were. Hmm, okay. So on the training side of the house, though, I would say that so especially on the special operations side, they have always had these pre-accession courses. So, so these courses have always, always been there. So they're not, nobody is developing any new courses. So with regard to it, was there a cost to develop something? No, actually not. And so the benefit, though, is huge for both men and women. We learned better ways to prepare people to succeed at the school. Again, so again, better ways to make sure, again, we're strengthening bone density and bone mass and making sure, teaching them ways to do things so that they don't injure themselves, use the core, the things that Agnes said. So again, all of those benefits go to both men and women. So in, in the few minutes before I open it up to the uh, members, I wanted to discuss some of the emotional um, questions that get brought up. Now, you're a former serving Marine. Yes. Um, you mentioned, as we were chatting before this, that there was a little bit of um, trepidation when you took uh, a commanding role at one point yes. among some of the people working for you. Yes. So. Um, I was privileged, I guess, to get commissioned after the Gulf War, so I was in that first year group of female combat engineers when the Marine Corps opened that to women. And so, of course, I experienced firsthand um, what it was like to integrate into an MOS that had been completely closed. And what I found was, same thing, right? So there was a lot of emotion, a lot of um, concern, a lot of people calling my Marines to express consternation about the fact that they were being now led by a woman and what the concern was. Um, but but I think, like, my, my own personal experience was there were a lot of myths, there was a lot of confusion, but, but once they understood who I was and what I did and that I did exactly what they did, everything was fine. So we, we see that in the special operations community. We see that across the board. When we first started talking about this in 2010, we saw a lot of those same concerns across the Army and these misunderstandings of, of what, what a woman could or could not do. Misunderstandings or misconceptions? Misconceptions, actually, yes, thank you, that's better, of what, what they could or couldn't do. Um, and I think, again, I felt once you get there and they get 
they understand and they see you and they see you operate, those things over time go away. So how about the, the other two sort of um, uh, lightning rod questions? How men respond when a woman is under fire and what happens to esprit de corps when you have women in the mix and all of a sudden you've got guys flirting with women, et cetera. These are two things that are always brought up um, after the first beer when you get a group of special operators together. Yeah. But maybe I'll just make a couple points early on this. First one is that, and as this came up in the interview with General McChrystal when we were working on Ashley's War, is that women have been in Delta for a long time. Right, so, so a lot of this, force. right. And so, you know, clandestine. right, and, and, and quietly, and obviously, but, you know, he brought that up. It's like, you know, this is not a, a terribly new uh, conversation. Um, but the second thing that I think is really important is that oftentimes I don't think we give enough credit to men alongside whom these women are serving. And it was something I saw in two years of working on. Uh, you know, trying to talk and talk and talk to people um, who had been on the front lines in the special operations community, some rangers who had done 12, 13, 14 deployments in the post-9-11 wars with a country that barely knew people were doing one, right? And you would talk to them, and what they would tell you was, I want somebody next to me who is competent, who is skilled, and who will make sure that they can do the job. And if you, you know, pay your rent out there every night, you earn your seat on the bird, period. And, and I think that you know, the, the demands of combat, the very life and death stakes of these wars erases so much of this discussion that goes on in nice rooms and, you know, in cities where power goes on when you flip a switch and the roads are smooth and, and uh, there's infrastructure that works, right? When you're in very tough parts of the world, when there is a very real war going on, what these guys were focused on was, can you do your job? Will you slow me down? And do you make a difference out there every single night and find what we need? You know, there, one of the uh, uh, MPs who's in Ash military police, uh, who's in Ashley's war, was telling me the story about the SEAL team she was working with that actually wasn't terribly excited to get her when she first uh, showed up. But you know, one of the first nights out, she found the intel item they were looking for in a baby's wet diaper in the quarters that they would never have searched, which meant that they found the person, they got the thing, and everybody got home safely without having to be out there any longer. And for the SEALs, you know, then they, even when there were regulations about whether women could fast rope or not, they actually trained their CST to fast rope, because they were like, look, if you're going to be on mission with us, then you need to know everything we do, and we, we decide if you're, if you're ready. And so I think what you see is people who've seen a lot of war, which is a huge percent of a 1%. Mm. Uh, are much less focused on these kinds of discussions and much more focused on whether you can deliver on the battlefield. And I don't think they get enough credit for that. And Agnes, you were and studying the different militaries. We have to bring up the Israeli example. They took women out of their combat units because the men fell apart when they saw the women injured. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, there are a lot of people put up the Israeli um, example is kind of the poster child, but they, they have a lot of constraints on their women as well. So, you know, yeah, we, you in mean? terms of rules of engagement and things like that, um, and uh, they couldn't be on the front lines and, and those kinds of things. So you can't, uh, it's not a direct, analog, directly analogous to, you know, what we're talking about here mm, okay. um, in the U.S. But, I mean, we, we definitely uh, covered or, and studied this issue of cohesion because that was a major concern across the services, because they were concerned that if cohesion deteriorated, that would impact uh, mission effectiveness. Um, and what we found is that really, uh, you know, during these previous waves of integration of women into these MOSs, there was no degradation of cohesion. Um, and the reason for that is that um, really it was this focus of t uh, task cohesion. People were concerned about whether you could do the job or not, um, regardless of whether or not the person to your right or left is a man or a woman. Um, and so, um, you know, that task cohesion is, was really the center. People don't necessarily need to like each other um, to work together, um, but they really care about whether the person um, can do the job. And this gets back to the standards piece, I think. Yeah. Um, so, so this is why standards are so important. So the, the, the survey, the SOCOM survey that you did, when you asked, you know, what do you feel about women joining combat units, and there was a highly negative response, was there a way to, to 
differentiate um, between who had served alongside women and who hadn't? Yes, we, we found that. And, and uh, um, this is actually very similar to the work that we did um, when we were looking at um, you know, the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. We looked at cohesion issues, um, and we, we did a, a large survey then, which at that point it was, um, you know, they couldn't openly admit that they were gay or lesbian, but we were able to find a way to survey them. Um, and we found that, um, you know, when we talked to service members, um, those that had served along with women in higher headquarters um, in particular, um, and in the case of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, those who had, um, you know, interacted with gays or lesbians were much more am amenable to the fact that this would be okay. Um, and so this is, this is very typical of when you, um, you know, integrate these outgroups. If you've had contact with them, you're, you tend to be more, the survey data uh, indicates that you tend to be more um, amenable to them. Okay. Well, it's 9 o'clock, so at this time I'd like to invite members to join our conversation with their questions. A uh, reminder that this meeting is on the record, and uh, also please speak into the microphones that are in front of you and um, state your name and affiliation. Please limit yourself to one question and keep it concise to allow as many members as possible to speak. <coughs> and while people think of their questions, I will ask one more. Um, selective service. Now that combat roles are open, is it time for every young woman to go into the post office and sign up for a potential draft? So what Secretary Carter said is that the, the issue of selective service has got to be part of a broader national discussion. That's not just mm -hmm. DOD. So we're, we think it's time to have that conversation. We're prepared to do that, but that's... Well, okay, well, saying let's have a conversation is not stating which way you think the conversation should go. <laughs> that's very careful. No, absolutely, and, I, and, and that the Secretary has been very clear to say this is outside the purview of just the Department of Defense, and so, um, and so we're, we're not there yet. That's something we absolutely need to look at, but again, it's, it, it's beyond just this very discreet issue, so we need to make sure that we take everything into consideration before that decision is made. So um, let's see. I wanted to ask members to tilt their placards up when they have a question. I haven't done one of the... Ma'am. I, I don't know if there's um, a mic circulating, but. Can you uh, lean so, into that mic? Thank sure, you. Sure, sure. So I'm Jen Leonard. I'm with International Crisis Group. Um, thank you so much for your comments. It's not an issue I've dug really deep into, but tracking um, in headlines. We've talked a lot about standards, everyone meeting standards. It'd be great to hear from you, whether anecdotally or research evidence-driven, um, about exceeding those standards and unique qualifications and whether and how in your research in terms of looking at allies, et cetera, there have been bits of evidence that have shared with you why women might excel at a particular um, category, set of issues, resilience, troubleshooting, et cetera. Um, if there's not, uh, where are we going to track that too? Thank you. Who would like to take a stab at that? Or, or I can. So, it, yes, we, a lot of people talk about a concern about don't lower standards, but, but you're absolutely right. So we identified places um, across the board where perhaps the standard was too low and needed to be raised. Um, we use often the airborne example. The pack weight had been historically 45 pounds, and that had been around since World War II. Uh, that's not reflective of what you need to carry on today's battlefield. So that was an example of a physical standard that actually needed to be raised in this particular case. Now, with regard to the, the things that you were saying, kind of more on the cognitive resilience side of the house. So for instance, in the special operations community, there are, they do test and assess people for um, decision-making skills, emotional stability, all of that type of stuff. But those are already standards that have been in place. Uh, so again, right, but there are certainly areas where women will excel and we'll see that hopefully come out as we move forward. I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Ag. Yeah, so um, the data on this is really kind of mixed um, and this is why we emphasize to the services that as they do this, they really need to monitor this progress and see where they, they're seeing those areas. Um, and, you know, in deficiencies, they may be able to, you know, do things to, to help them. Um, so. Yeah, it's very, unfortunately, it's very mixed, um, so. Okay. 
Um, Sunil? Oh, Laura. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Laura Liswood, um, three years on Dakowitz, so some sense of, of this, and 13 years reserve sergeant, Metropolitan Police Department. And can you remind people what Dakowitz is? Uh, yes, the Defense Advisory Committee on Women in the Services. It's been around since the Korean War and has looked at various elements. Uh, one of the elements that we looked at was uh, women on submarines. And some of the outgroup objections to blacks on submarines, you could have just taken the, the language out of that and said why women shouldn't be on submarines. Unit cohesion, too close, wives don't like it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, my question is, in, in addition to this issue of the, the value added of diversity, which is getting more and more play in corporations and things like that, and therefore tracking that, which I think could be incredibly interesting to see uh, different perspectives, do you see that there's gonna be any diminution, increase, um, around issues of sexual harassment and issues of that nature? Be because the, these women are in units that <coughs> have never had women before? Yes, like and, and so it's, is it more of, oh, now we respect them and we understand what value that they have, et cetera, versus, mm -hmm. well, we have these close quarters and we have these issues? Yeah. Oh, sure. So, so I would say, do, do we expect an increase? I, I certainly hope not, but I think we recognize that, that that's something we need to look at. That's what each of the services, um, to the point that we were talking about surveys before, that's why all of the services, you hear a lot of discussion about the SOCOM survey, but all of the services um, did surveys of one sort, one, right? Why, why? Because we need to identify where there are those misconceptions, and then we need to develop training, or we need to make sure that we explain that where, where those things are incorrect, so we don't have that, um, and as well to identify any potential issues that need to be addressed. But we don't view this issue as anything, you know, sexual harassment and sexual assault, it's not tolerated in the department, it's not acceptable. And so this is no different than any other effort, and we view it no differently. Uh, I was gonna say, Gail, can you point out some of your folks in the crowd? Who uh, might yeah, and then there are two things I wanna just get up that we were talking about before. Um, so the program, the, the cultural support teams, which was a very benign name for a pretty groundbreaking concept, uh, was created by Admiral Olson, who was the first Navy SEAL to lead Special Operations Command. And, uh, you know, I had a C-SPAN caller the other day say that, you know, is this part of the feminist agenda? And I said, well, I, I don't think Admiral Olson was known for his mm -hmm. feminist agenda. I think he was really focused on the security gap that his forces were facing in the field. And when uh, I had the pleasure of talking with him in the process of reporting, he was asking me about uh, the, the soldiers, the young women who were here, who were part of this team. And I, he was asking me what they were like. And I was filling him in because he had retired just before the program had been in full swing. And, and he said, so they're just like the men. And I said, yeah. He said, you know, what I look for in special operations, it's physically fit problem solvers. He said, people want to ascribe all kinds of superhuman traits to the special operations community, but that's at the core of what we're seeking. And I think that was, was really important. And, and to Laura's point about uh, African Americans and other integration, it's really interesting talking to one of the rangers who did pre-mission training with the soldiers in Ashley's War. And he was very skeptical when they said he had to go train girls. That was his official assignment uh, at, at, from when he was at Benning to go down to Fort Bragg. And, uh, to, to go to Bragg to, to train uh, members of this team. And, you know, really at the end of eight days, this guy who by no means would he care about any kind of equality or agenda, you know, that is not his world. You know, he said, you know, I looked around and I thought, you know, these may one day be our own Tuskegee Airmen, right? Like these are people who are gonna make history and no one knows they exist. A and I do think that there are a lot of parallels and, and it's hard to see that in the moment, I think it's hard for, and all of us who chronicle it to see it in the much wider picture, but I think 50 years from now, this moment will look very different than, than it does right now. Um, oh, and, and, and I wanted I to just say, point out, um, there are three of the soldiers who are in uh, Ashley Soar who are here, and maybe you could just uh, stand up for a quick moment. Yeah. Hi, my hey. name's Amy Sexauer. Uh, I'm still active duty captain serving at Fort Bragg. Oh, sorry, oh. microphone please. <laughs> Hi, Captain Amy Sexauer, uh, still active duty Army, serving at Fort Bragg. Captain Rachel Washburn, also serving at Fort Bragg. Um, Captain Megan Curran, I'm in the uh, Massachusetts Army Reserve now. 
and, and can I put the three of you on the spot? Have I, any of you encountered sexual harassment when you were in these unique jobs when you first entered them? Um, I think to Gail's point, um, we don't give enough credit to the, to the men mm -hmm. in, in this conversation a lot of the times. Um, I think that what we have to remember, especially with the groups that we worked with, the special operations community, they're consummate professionals. Um, and I think from my personal experience, I never saw um, anything to that effect. Um, and I, I really just, I think that that, that conversation is not, is not addressed um, as much, that, that we need to give more credit to the men in these situations. Um, and they're there to do a mission, and we were there to enable a mission. And um, it's, it's almost as simple as that. And a lot of this other conversation um, really doesn't matter when you're, when you're in a high stakes environment. So that's my personal experience. I don't know. Thank you very much. Just add one. It was really fascinating when I was working on, uh, I was just telling uh, Mara Sullivan this, and I was working on Ashley's War, you know, it's Washington, so you don't talk about what you're working on very much. <laughs> and occasionally I would, I'd say it's a special operations story. I'd be like, oh, that's awesome. I, you know, I love Lone, Re uh, Lone Survivor, and I love American Sniper. And you'd say, oh, and there, there are women in it. It was like crickets. And inevitably, the next question from men and from women was, oh, is it about rape or PTSD? Yeah. And that was really eye-opening for me, the first, second, third time I heard it. And by the end, I was kind of prepared because there is absolutely urgent that the issue of military sexual assault is front and center, 100%. But when the valor story is missing, it affects the rest of the conversation about service, period, whether it's male or female. But I, I, I thank Laura for bringing it up, though, because that's yeah, one of the absolutely. reasons that Dakowitz was originally founded was to represent uh, women in... Um, the military writ large. So it's a question that needs to be asked, but 100%. it's great to have it just knocked on the head, especially by somebody who served out there. Um, Sunil. Hi, my name is Sunil Desai. I'm a retired U.S. Marine as well, infantry officer. Um, I love the book. I've read the whole book and uh, was uh, intrigued by it. Um, and I appreciate everything that I've heard. I agree with pretty much everything. Um, and just... Uh, wanted to make two small points and just my perspective. Again, I married a uh, Army officer who could do more push uh, pull-ups, probably push-ups too, than most of the Marines that I knew. And, and so I respected that and, and, uh, amongst a lot of other things. Um, but uh, the, the, the first point would be regarding the standards. Um, and I never bought into the idea that that, uh, those, that was some of the reasons that women shouldn't shouldn't serve in, in combat roles, even, even when I was a young officer. So, um, but one point that didn't come up is, while there is a pass-fail standard, uh, you have to meet some bare minimum, the, the, the standards still exist on a scale. And the military, in addition to the requirement for you know, tactical execution on the battlefield, there's this inspiration that comes from the people who can achieve even more, right? And I think even the women in the book, you see that from them. They really admire people who, who are super fit and even more than and necessary. And so there's, a, there's an element of that that should be added to, to the conversation. I mean, the seniors, you've spoke with some of these special ops leaders who are physical, I mean, well beyond. Even as they get older, they don't hold themselves to the sliding standard that you allow for the aging. They hold themselves to the original, the highest standard, and, and that's, that's admired and, and, uh, and valued and respected. And then the one other the small one, and you touched on it with your last question about the draft, and I have a daughter now too, but I think beyond that, this subject and the experiences speak to the even broader question of what's happening, not only in our country, but in society writ large, just in, in terms of how families are evolving, how work is evolving, um, and there's several other current books that are hot in the, in the CFR world, um, whether it's uh, Lean In or Unfinished Business, right? And, and then there's another one called The End of Men. So I, I think all these dynamics are happening, and they all have to be thought of holistically together if we're going to get to the right answer for, for everybody. So um, one of the things I hear you saying is that, that physical fitness might be one of the ways just to put all doubts to rest if you're more fit than everyone else. Um, but 
going back to this question of participation in society and are we uneven? It's the question that Ash Carter doesn't want to be the only one asking, but do we need women in the draft to follow through with this, um, you know, uh, to, to, if you're going to allow women to be in combat roles in the military, shouldn't they be um, part of the wider communities, um, well, serving the wider community? I, I guess I'm stumbling around on this one because it's such, it, it's such a, um, I, I can see my, my own parents would have freaked out about it, but then you, you look at some of the um, discussions brought up by people like General Stanley McChrystal that shouldn't we have at least a wider national service? Um, so where does that stand, that discussion? Well, right, again, that, that's, that's the crux of the issue, right? Do we, we need to have a larger national discussion on right, public service, national service, and where do we need to go from there? I think from our perspective, right, we have an all-volunteer force, mm -hmm. and we're, we're meeting the requirements that we have right now. Now, whether we have a draft or don't have a draft or whether they expand selective service or they don't expand selective service, we think certainly we need to be part of that discussion, but it doesn't... We, 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 are, we have what we need, and we have great people coming in, and that was what Secretary Carter was kind of focused on, on the all-volunteer force. He didn't want to restrict his ability to recruit to only half the population. But, but isn't that, in, in, in a sense, well, it's ducking the question. And if, if you're going to make this um, a touchstone of your administration that you fought <laughs> for this level of equality for first having um, gays in the military and then allowing women to go into combat roles, why not follow it through with, um, and we believe if we're, rep if we're backing these two principles, why not take a stand on having women in selective service? So, right, I, 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 mean, I, I understand it, the question. I, yeah. guess, I guess we're, again, where we are is, we're, we're, at, we're at the beginning of that discussion, and I think it's just to, to kind of take a position on it before we've actually even had the full-blown conversation is probably premature. But one thing I think is so interesting is that we talk about equality, and I think it's also really about talent, right? It's about finding the right pool of the right people for the right jobs, and I think that's the, the national security discussion. That's the national security question. It's not about social programs, right? I think it's about security gaps and about having the, the best force. And I think the, the draft question is fascinating because what the, the Selective Service was abolished in 73 and then bought back in 1980 when the Russians invaded Afghanistan. Uh, and, you know, that was a long time ago now. And think about how much war has been fought since then. I think the whole conversation should be updated. What, you know, should 18-year-old young men have to register? Should 18-year-old young women? What are the options for, I mean, you know, one parent told me I would much rather have my daughter defend my country than my son. You know, I mean, parents come up to you all the time and tell you sort of very colorful things. But, I mean, I think it goes to the fact that it's a, sort of an outdated way of viewing a world that has fundamentally shifted. Because to your point, Sunil, about looking at things in silos, this is a much bigger conversation about a world that is on fire in many different places with a shape of a threat that has changed and a, um, I think an, an international architecture that hasn't changed with it. And going to that, a national um, infrastructure that hasn't really kept pace with the time. So how do you think of the broader question about how you defend and protect and serve so, so you're saying that the policy was really changed because it's about getting access to talent for the mission at hand rather than an issue of overall fairness and oh, equalizing the playing field. Oh, absolutely. That, Secretary Carter was very, was very clear about that. He was about recruit by the all-volunteer force. He said, you never know where your next Olympic athlete is going to come. So why would I voluntarily just cut my recruiting pool in half? It made no sense to him. Agnes, in your study of other militaries, did you find, were there other militaries that um, draw from the whole pool of the population in terms yes. of the draft? Yes. Um, and, you know, uh, the reason for integrating these combat roles was different across the countries, too. Many of them were forced to. Um, they, they had equal opportunity um, issues, uh, lawsuits, things like that. So that, it was interesting because, it, you know, it was interesting to see those various um, uh, reasons. And some of them thought that, you know, this was the right thing to do for equality reasons. We took a different route. Um, 
and and so um, you know their strategies have been different too that kind of um, shaped the way that they uh, actually implemented um, this and some of them had quotas which we found actually didn't work um, they never met them <laughs> because their numbers were so small mm -hmm. um, and you know that sort of set back the process so what were the numbers like what can we expect what was an average so of in no numbers of women in combat roles? yeah and in, in none of the countries that we looked at um, did we find anything above um, low single percentages you're in saying these, two percent or nine percent? Like five, six was the highest. Mm -hmm. um, so Canada was at one point. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, some of them are just very, very low. So, for instance, Canada, which uh, integrated their infantry almost uh, 25 years ago. Yes. 25 years ago, and their numbers hover around the one percent range right now. So again, but those right. So that was informative for us in back to your question about the standards. So we need to kind of continue the discussion about low numbers or no one is fine, right, because this, you have to meet the standard. And so, right, we have to, to continue to make sure that people understand that we are fully comfortable with, with having low numbers. So, so to play devil's advocate, that it's interesting, you're, um, Gail just talked about you, you want to open up all of the force to look for talent, but then it's only filling one person or pro will probably only fill 1% of those roles. It, it's, right. it's uh, to play the devil's advocate, it's a, a lot of churn and a lot of expense to look at this to, to open everything up to get only 1% of those roles filled. Well, you could say that, or, or again, we don't know who's out there that mm -hmm. may, we, we have no idea what it's gonna look like. So you don't know what those young, young girls in high school are capable of and, and wanting to do moving forward. So we may see increased numbers. Again, as we look at training properly, like better ways to, and, and fitness and building that body mass, looking at, at BMI and, and bone strengthening, you, you never know. We may actually have more numbers in the United States. Yeah. It was fascinating. So I was at West Point uh, in the fall. And one of the things that was really fascinating there was, I, you know, they, you come in and you're supposed to give this talk. And I said, well, I just have a question for you. You know, how many of you want to go into into infantry and, and, and you know, hands shot up. And just to think that they are on the cusp of this change, right? There are young women at West Point who would come up to you and say, I've always felt like there were two tiers, jobs that, you know, everybody could do and then jobs that, you know, women couldn't. And I, I've always wanted to be in infantry. There were a couple of the young women who were soldiers in Ashley's War who actually didn't enlisted and didn't know that women couldn't be in the infantry. Um, or ROTC cadets who were, you know, at the top of their ROTC, uh, but actually couldn't be in infantry when they came out. And so, you know, you see all kinds of what I would call inefficiencies in the system in some ways, right, that are being leveled out. But I, I have never heard anybody talk about huge numbers. But the, is there a talent pool out there? You, you do see it. Well, I, I, hey, I went to Wellesley. I'm just I'm trying to, uh, we, this is not a very skeptical audience, no, so I'm trying to channel the skeptics the who are out I, there. All of these questions come up, and, and I think it's really important to have discussions <coughs> about them, because otherwise people feel like, well, gosh, you know, um, they're just having a conversation divorced from reality, and, and the truth is you just want to have a reflection of what's already happening. Mm. So uh, um, if I could say quickly um, about the cost piece, we actually ran a very detailed cost analysis in our Marine Corps work. Um, and we looked at attrition rates for women and you know how, how, how many women you would need to bring in to keep the infantry at the same level it is today and those kinds of issues. And we found that it's less than 1% of the overall personnel budget. So again, this, I think that there's this misconception that it will be very expensive and that mirrors what um, the other services have found too. So less than 1% of the overall personnel budget, what are we talking? Because you guys have big budgets. Um, <laughs> yeah, I can't, I, it was very small. Um, I mean, I, sorry, I can't think of the. Um, Tens of millions? It was, uh, I think it was, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, but it was, it, overall in the scheme, it was very small. Very small. Yes. Yeah. Sir. Damon. Uh, we can't hear you. Damon Porter with the Association of Global Automakers. We know oftentimes that policy decisions are not made in a vacuum, and clearly there's demonstrable evidence, as we've discussed today, why women should be in combative 
uh, forces. But can we talk a little bit from the historical perspective? We've, we've raised the issues of physical standards. How much um, such as Title IX were, were shaping the ability of demonstrating the physical dexterity and, and um, ability of women and to serve in combative roles? And I guess the other point to that question is how much can women in combative forces help shape the policy, policy discussions outside of armed services such as equal pay? So suddenly we have a whole bunch of questions with only six minutes left. So I'm going to ask a couple of people, yeah, a couple of people, a couple questions in a row. Can we take your question? Hi, yes. I'm Sally Adams, and I'm here on behalf of the Women in Military Service for America Memorial called WIMSA. And we're the only memorial that honors all women across all ser services in the nation. And in 2014, a DOD report came out and said that DOD spends about $90 million on 87 military service uh, museums, and not one of those is dedicated to women. And I just wanted to know, during this time of unprecedented progress um, in the military, if the time is ripe for support for this institution, as well as other memorials and museums that honor women. OK. And one more? Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Christine. I'm an undergraduate student um, at Georgetown University, but I uh, just transitioned out of the Marine Corps. I was a corporal. I transitioned out in July. Um, I was an Arabic linguist. And right now at school, I do a lot of research on understanding the Muslim world. Um, and we talked a little bit about um, the unique advantage that women bring to the battlefield. And especially as the decision's already been made for integration, I, I hope to switch the conversation to like, okay, it's, it's, it's decided now, so what are we uniquely gonna bring to this, to this arena? Um, so my question is, do you think women will provide a unique advantage and how can we capitalize that, specifically when we're talking about women encountering violent extremism, which I know a lot of NGOs and think tanks are focusing on, and so I'm wondering if the DOD specifically has, has looked at how we can integrate women specifically to capitalize on, on women's unique skills in that arena. So we have three questions and three minutes left. Mm -hmm. Starting with that one, unique skills that women can provide. Are there specific things you're recruiting them for within combat roles that help in those areas? I, mean, I think I think that that goes to one of the earlier questions, right? So there, 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 women and men, there are differences, and so perhaps there are the things that women can bring to the discussion. And I think it gets to, to Ashley's war. There were very unique skill sets where the special operations community you know, realizes they need help. So this was just really, this was a recognition of what was actually already going on in the fights in Iraq and Afghanistan. So, I mean, to answer your question, yes, but again, that's part of that entire discussion. That was the reason behind all of this. We wanted to be able to use the skills of, of the women that were out there. And the Title IX question, sorry. Yeah. Title IX, I think, is fascinating. Um, one thing, if uh, I noticed a couple things that were across the board on the, the soldiers who were part of the Ashley's War, and the Rangers were really taking, specifically the direct action side, were taking you know the most fit. And as one Ranger said, if nobody else liked you, we did. Uh, you know, they were looking for people who were ready to go out and, and be fit and fierce and be able to keep up on those kinds of special operations missions. And almost all of them were track athletes. Almost all of them had been um, raised by fathers who had always treated them the same as their brothers. Or if they had no other uh, siblings who were brothers, they were held to the highest of standards. And uh, athleticism and sports was very much a theme for across the board. And they can talk to you about that uh, more afterward. But you really did see that uh, across the board in terms of uh, always having been fit, always having trained to a very high standard. And um, uh, Amy, who's here, actually played high school football all four years. She's going to be mortified when I tell you that. Uh, and, and didn't want to after the first couple of years. But little girls would come up to her at games and say that she wanted, they wanted to be like her. Uh, and that was sort of hard to, to quit after that. So, you know, I do think Title IX very much played a role in, in the physical uh, athleticism and the opportunities. You had something to I add. Did, I wanted to add one quick point. I think something that was fascinating for me is about you asked, how are these women going to affect? A lot of the senior men that were involved in this conversation, right, they have daughters. 
and, and a lot of their thinking on this issue was formed by those daughters and, and, and what they wanted to see. You know, their, their daughters were phenomenal, and why shouldn't my daughter be able to do this? And many of those daughters are serving in uniform as young captains and lieutenants now. So I absolutely think, and they may not be on the cusp, they may not be, but they are out there, and they are absolutely the ones that are continue to inform this discussion. That's, I think that's fascinating about all of the dads. And uh, last quick point, the women institutions or museums memorializing women in the military? Right, so absolutely. WIMSA does some phenomenal work, and we thank you for what you do. I can't exactly, but budgets are tight, and we certainly support the work that you do. It's fantastic. Thank you, thank you very much. I want to thank the panelists for answering some tough questions and showing the public out there that the tough questions have been asked um, before in enacting this policy. And thank you all for attending this session on Women in the Armed Forces, the Future of the Military. That concludes the CFR session.